but let me just pause and say to everyone who's already in, thank you so much. Um, I will begin the introductions and we'll just go from there. Uh, I, uh, I welcome the Sunday to you. Uh, thank you so much for um, for for signing up for um, for um, for being a part of this conversation. For those of you who joined us last year at uh, Patrick and Stevens House in Bronzeville in Chicago, um, welcome back. It's not the way we planned, but we're having it anyway. And also to those who are from, not from Chicago, who are from other parts of the country who joined in. We welcome you as well. I'm Roderick Hawkins. I'm a member of the Board of Land Illegal, the nation's oldest and largest legal defense organization dedicated to the full civil rights of LGBTQ plus people and everyone living with HIV. And on behalf of Land Illegal, I am excited to welcome you all here. Land Illegal recognizes the LGBTQ plus community and organizations that serve our community have a long way to go to fully address issues impacting our You cannot start your video because the house has But same. Lambda is con committed to doing the work and to do better. And that's part of what today's event is about. Lambda Legal recognizing and celebrating the lives of Black LGBTQ plus people. And I'm proud to be a part of that celebration. And only because I'm a board member, but also I'm a proud Black gay Southern man from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And there weren't many movies about me or my life growing up or films about my life or, you know, even art, you know, documentary or histories about our lives, which is why this movie is so important to me. Seeing these voices and the stories similar to mine is so important. And I am beyond thrilled to be joined today by my dear friend, my brother, and uh, one of the forces behind uh, Making Sweet Tea, Dr. E. Patrick Johnson. Um, my story with E. Patrick and this film goes back long before today. In fact, uh, 15 years ago, um, in 2005, uh, Patrick was sitting in my little tiny apartment in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where I was then working for the then governor of Louisiana. Uh, we were there sipping wine and spilling lots of tea. I am one of the men of Sweet Tea, the book. And Patrick has ways of getting things out of you. I've spilled all kinds of tea. I spilled everybody's tea I could spill, including my own. But I'm so happy that the book became Sweet Tea, the play, became Making Sweet Tea, the film. And now that play of the book <laughs> is now published into a book that others can use for, 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 for um, production. So it's been a tremendous journey. And I am glad to have been a, played a small part of being one of the men of Sweet Tea. But enough about me. Let's get, you're not here for me, you're here for the conversation and to hear some tea and talk some tea. And we're gonna have an opportunity for you to ask questions as well. So all that being said, um, E. Pat, if you already, if you, I hope you all of you watched the film or are going to finish watching the film. You already know about E. Patrick Johnson um, from Hickory, North Carolina. But in addition to being an author, a scholar, a filmmaker, a storyteller, a son, a husband, and a friend, he is uh, just on his ninth day as the dean of the School of Communication at Northwestern University. The, the man truly does it all. So, without further ado, um, welcome my friend, uh, Dr. E. Patrick Johnson. Let's talk about this journey. As I mentioned, you know, there was the book, there, there was the research, there was the interviews all across the South, there was the book. This journey is a long journey and this journey has legs. So tell us about what began you on this journey to tell our stories. And also, did you think that this, this story, all this tea of Black Southern gay men would have so much, um, would, would still be just working the circuit for lack of a better expression. <laughs> Well, I first would just like to thank Lambda Legal uh, for all the work that the organization does. Uh, we've uh, been supporters for quite a long time now, and uh, we posted a number of events um, at our home, Shaven Sins, uh, in Chicago. And um, I also want to thank you, Roderick, for being a partner. Uh, for sweet tea and for just being fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Um, so um, this uh, book has been quite the journey. Uh, started out uh, the idea for the book, 1995. So we're talking a long, long time. Um, and I never imagined that it would... Uh, become so many iterations, a book, a stage reading, a play, and now a film. Um, but one of the things I think that uh, those different mediums speak to is the power of these stories, uh, that they can be told through so many different forms. And uh, the thing for me as the 
uh, curator of these stories and the collaborator with these men is that it's always privilege the men and their stories, uh, giving them a platform to share their lives with people uh, now around the world. And one of the things that's so moving for me as uh, this material takes these different forms is the lives that it touches, particularly in this, in this moment of uh, continued anti-Black racism and white supremacy, uh, homophobia, transphobia. I think that stories like this uh, give voice to a group of folks who haven't always had uh, a platform to have that voice. Uh, the film specifically came about through uh, John Jackson, who is the co-director and the co-executive producer um, who saw the play 10 years ago, now over 10 years ago in um, Chicago when it premiered uh, through About Face Theater, uh, a collaboration between About Face Theater and Jane M. Sachs. And he felt that the film uh, should sort of be about how the play uh, sort of behind the scenes of the play, if you will. You know, how do you adapt a um, story uh, to a um, to the stage, and then uh, how it could be interesting to to capture that on film? But of course, as with all things, uh, as you start to do the project itself, it turns into so many other. Uh, Thing. So what was a story about the making of the play became about uh, what has happened to these men since I first interviewed them over a decade ago? What has uh, been my own journey back to the South to have a kind of reckoning uh, with my hometown being an openly gay man? Um, what is... Uh, happening with these men uh, and, and my relationship with them. And then finally, what would it be like to actually present someone's life back to them in their own space? So that's the kind of experimental component of the film where I'm performing the men's stories in front of them, in their homes, on their jobs, at their church, uh, in some ways. At, so, at the club they performed at, in. At the club. Uh, so the, 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 the trick, once you know, we had the 80 hours of footage um, that we had, was how to tell those four stories at the same time in a way that made sense. Um, but you know, the audience, you can tell me <laughs> if we were successful, uh, but we think, uh, we think we were. No, I think it was, and I, I'll say this, I'll take a point of personal privilege. I um, saw, saw the rough cut, saw the final cut, and it's a tremendous journey. And I had the pleasure of, um, there you are, yay, having some, Hi. Um, <laughs> hey, he's here, y'all, he's here, yay, oh, okay. This, so, um, this, and the crowd, and the crowd roars. We hear you too, Stephen, so tell Stephen he's got to stop being the tech guy and give, give the phone to his husband, all right. Okay, so, you know what? Y'all, we're, we're live, we're going to roll with this, we're making it happen. Patrick and Stephen are not at their house right now. They're on the far north. They're in the north suburbs. And they, hey, Stephen. And I'm out here on the East Coast, but it's all good. We are here now. So yes. I'm, so, so thank you for telling those stories. And I, I want to speak about, let's, I want to talk about you a little bit more now. Let's talk about Hickory. You shared <laughs> so much of your journey in this film. And uh, personally, thank you for sharing Mama Sarah with us, with all of us. Um, why was it important to you to take, as you were taking this deep dive into the lives of all the men, not just in the book, but also the, the men in particular who were in the film, um, how, wh why was it important for you to take the deep dive into your own journey? So, you know, I, I have been an uh, unwilling participant uh, in terms of being, the, in terms of having the spotlight turned to me. Uh, that was the case with the play, uh, the producers, directors, like, we need your story in here. And I was like, you know, I was, you know, ran the other way, kicking and screaming. Um, 
And the same with the film. I didn't want the focus to be on me. But one of the things that everybody said uh, who's involved with this project is that what's interesting about this project is your relationship to these men yes. and how that has evolved. And also, because you are a Black gay man from a small town in the South, that's also important, too, for you to spill your tea. Mm. Uh, and that's the thing that I ran away from. You know, there's that old saying that, you know, you should do the run toward the things that you're most afraid of. And I didn't want to have that reckoning. I did not want to um, confront all the demons that I, I needed to confront about my hometown of Hickory and the fact that uh, I had been closeted uh, to most of my hometown, even though I was out to my family, uh, that I had not um, stood in my own truth when they were celebrating my accomplishments at you know, E. Patrick Johnson Day. Yeah. Uh, and what all that meant for me. So one of the things that uh, was humbling for me was I had to, in some ways, turn the microphone uh, toward myself and ask of myself the things I had asked of, this, of the men that I interviewed, and that is to speak your truth. And sometimes your own truth is ugly. Mm. Uh, and you need to do the work that you need to do to get to where you need to be. Right. And uh, that's what we saw somewhat in the play and definitely in the film. Absolutely. Well, we appreciate you going, taking that deep dive. Um, and I'm glad to be the one to kind of turn the tables today and try to get some more, <laughs> get some more tea out of you. So we'll see how far we can get in the limited time we have. And again, we're going to have opportunities for audience questions. And we ask the audience, um, our attendees, if you could um, just drop your questions in the Q&A box and we will get to some of those um, in, as time permits. Um, um, let's talk about some of the men. Let's talk about the men. We, you know, we have, you, you, you've, you've got, you know, I'm gonna, I got them all. You've got, you've got Sean, you've got Freddie, you've got Duncan Teague, full name, Duncan Teague. You've got, you, you've got, you've got Chad, Char Charles, Charles um, Jr. Um, you've, you've, you've got um, the Harolds. You've got Countess Vivian. I mean, you've got, you, you, I, I'm just curious. I mean, I want to, and I know some of this, but I want our our attendees to kind of get a sense of what's it like to tell the story, document the story, then come back around, put it in the play, but then go and perform these segments in front of these men. You went to the Harold's home with your sweater and the spectacles. You did, you know, you are my friend in front of Charles, and that was a very strong reaction he had. And um, there's so I, I'll stop there. You get it. You all watched it, so y'all know what I'm talking about. So I would love to hear from you. What that was like um, performing them in front of them in their spaces that, you know, their homes, their, you know, their, 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 the clubs and all those things. That, that, I think that's very fascinating as you not just, you documented, you, you heard, but you, you, you wrote it down, but you also performed it. What was that like for you and for them? Well, for me, it was uh, really confronting uh, because A, you know, it's one thing to, to have that separation uh, between yourself and the audience on the stage, mm -hmm. because all of them had, with the exception of Charles uh, and Countess Vivian, all of them had uh, either seen a stage reading or been to one of the theater productions and participated in Q and A's and so on and so forth. But when you're in someone's space, in the, sitting in their living room, and uh, performing them and sharing their story. That's quite, a, the, the stakes are, are different. And also having them, as Duncan does, critique me. You know, I would have cheated a little to the left there. <laughs> you, your voice is not quite as low as mine. Um, but uh, for me, it was, it was a humbling experience, but also <laughs> very frightening. Um, because you are, they've gifted you their story and you are trying to reflect their lives back to them in their own space and in a way that's not going to be uh, caricaturish or um, going to uh, diminish the story in any way. And so it's, it's really a, a sort of nebulous tightrope that you have to walk when you're doing that. Uh, I think for them, um, their reactions 
you know, there was a range from, you know, Freddie, who's just cracking up during the whole time, you know, the mean little sissy who's cutting people, um, to Charles, where it's just, and, and he says this, it was like looking at myself in the mirror. And it just so happens that there is a mirror uh, that is uh, trifurcated in the background. I mean, everything worked that day for that shot, because as you, as the audience are seeing all of that happen is you're seeing it at the same time that Charles saw it because he had never seen me perform and we didn't know what his reaction was going to be. Right. And so uh, the camera is there and capturing all of that. And it, and one version of the film, we didn't have his reaction. Uh, the, we had part of the reaction, but we didn't have uh, the, um, the cutaway where he has to literally compose himself, right. go off and come right. back. Right. At one point that was not in the, that wasn't in the film. Uh, mm-hmm. But I felt that it was important to have all of that. Yes. Uh, and so for me, it was, you know, I, I can't watch that scene even now. And I've seen this film, you know, how many times without getting emotional because I flash back to that moment in that club. Because for him, all of those 46 years of life that he thought he was going down one path is sort of turned on its head. And he's still, I think, as the audience uh, recognizes, still struggling. Um, And it was just a, you know, very confronting moment. Um, Mm -hmm. And then with uh, the Heralds, oh my goodness. uh, I love the moment (laughs) when Harold says, when Harold Mays says, Mm -hmm. no, no, I'm sorry, when Harold Herman says, why is he pretending to be so old? <laughs> That's old school shade. <laughs> right, right, right. And now, now, for those who don't know, Harold, Harold, Harold Herman is the white partner, the white husband, yeah. right? And then Harold yeah. Mays is the, as the as the black got it, yeah. got it. Two Heralds. Yeah. So those who yeah. y'all watch it, I know. And so we had two Heralds, you know, who were married to each other together. So <laughs> yes, for fifty years. Yes, 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 yes. Um, the, um. <laughs> the other thing, I, the the last thing I'll say about that uh, to Roderick is. One of the things that was so meaningful to me was the fact that I got to, um, or we got to capture these men uh, on film before they passed away. Yes. Um, Because, you know, shortly after we finished shooting, in fact, uh, Harold Mays uh, uh, passed away in 2017, one year, Uh, almost to the date that Harold Herman passed away. And Stephen and I had flown to D.C. to actually record him making tea. And when we got there, he he was in the hospital and he never, um, Mm. he was never released. He passed away. And so um, that in memoriam at the end of the film is really, um, uh, really hard to get through because you see Countess Vivian, you see the Heralds, uh, and you see my mom. Yes. And all of them were a part of this project, but never lived to see the finished product. So um, I'm, yeah. sorry, I'm getting emotional about it's that. It's okay. And I'll, I'll, I'll take it from here for a second. Um, and for those who, again, you saw the beauty of Miss Sarah, and I, and I was one of the people who was very fortunate enough to get to meet Miss Sarah and know Miss Sarah. And and even got to meet um, the Herald um, in the process of this. And so this, it's, I, I am, what's the, be- the beautiful thing, and I got emotional when I actually started the film, watch, watch, rewatching again for I Stopped Counting too, seeing your mother preparing to sleep, the tea in the beginning. But, it, but the, the, the gift is you have preserved these stories. I think Stephen is talking another long time. Yes, yeah, sorry. Story. It's okay. Um, the gift is you have, we're live. Uh, the gift is you preserve these stories. And in a culture where our oral histories have been stripped from us and told by other people who are not us, look nothing like us, you reclaim those stories that have been whispered for so long. You know, you put the tea out and put it out there. And to see your mother 
and spilling her own tea about those two husbands, you know, <laughs> you know, you know that 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 will always be one of my favorite scenes in the movie. You know, he was a whore and, you know, <laughs> and the drunk. So, but so we honor the ancestors, Miss Sarah. We honor the Harolds. We honor Countess Vivian. And but let's talk about the importance of telling our stories. Uh, we know there's there's the we have this rich storytelling tradition in the diaspora, but. Tell us why you believe it's so important for Black folk to tell our stories and tell them ourselves. Yeah, so, you know, given that we are a history of people who were kept from literacy, uh, the only voice we had was our, uh, our song and our stories. And those, uh, that gift of voice is what carried us through the Middle Passage. We couldn't do nothing but drum or moan or yes. hum. It carried us through the slave fields. It carried us through Jim Crow. It carried us through civil rights. It carried us through the AIDS epidemic. Mm. Um, and so the, the, the um, ability to tell your own story uh, in your own words, in your own voice, um, is such a powerful thing for us because we've been kept from, uh, or people have attempted, I should say, uh, to keep us uh, from telling our own stories. They tried to represent us to ourselves in a way that we didn't recognize and that we knew that wasn't authentic to us. And so we've had to fight to create a space uh, to tell our stories. And we tell those stories on our front porches uh, as my mom and them did when I was a kid, um, sitting on the front porch, uh, gossiping about other folks. Uh, we've told those stories like Frederick Douglass and other uh, of our political leaders uh, have told them through uh, their oral histories. We've sung it out, we've moaned it. And so it's, it's vitally important. And you know we're experiencing that now, that how important it is for us to be in control of the narrative that is told about us and our lives. And on an individual level, um, it's really important for people to be able to tell their own stories to affirm who they are in the world. Um, one of the things that I've said over and over again when I have uh, been in these Q and A's and someone asked me, well, how did you get these people to tell you their stories? And I'm not being flippant when I respond with the following. I simply say, as I do at the end of the film, I asked. Absolutely. Not all of us have a story, but not all of us get to tell it. And so that's why I think it's important for Black folk to have a platform to tell our stories. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that so much. And uh, thank you for asking all of us who are in the book. Thank you for asking us to tell our stories. And um, um, now I'm about to get emotional, but I'm going to keep I'm going to keep it moving because that's my job today. Um, let's talk about. I want to let's go back to Charles. Um, I want to go back to Charles because I remember um, you, you make a good point. You make a point in the film. You, when you're talking to the director, I believe, of the play, when, this is the North. This is North Carolina production. It's the Durham, the Raleigh yes, Durham yes. show, yes. right? The Raleigh Durham show um, when the ice storm came. At any rate, um, <laughs> yes. you're talking about yeah. You're talking about Charles and how Charles was a role model for you. But then Charles's journey, and there's more detail in the book. So if you don't have the book, sweet tea, y'all get the book. Um, it, you talk about how you know he sort of kind of. I don't want to say, I'm trying to find the right language here, so forgive me, and I don't want to offend anyone. He kind of pulled back, if you will, right? From, he went so far as to steps, he did the, he did the psyche vows, he did the work, he lived, as a, he lived as a woman for years, and then pulled back and kind of went to this shell again. But in that strong reaction he had, in, into your performance of You Are My Friend on that stage, do you think... So? I want to be curious. Was it some? Was some of that part of it the reaction of like that mirror of who I used to be, and maybe question about maybe what I could have, I could have let something go that was really still an authentic part of me. I mean, I'm sorry for the long question. And also, how's he doing today? I'll stop there. Yeah. So I I chat with Charles via text or social media uh, weekly. Uh, Charles is still doing hair. Uh, still doing uh, my sister-in-law's hair. Uh, and uh, until recently was doing uh, my former pastor's hair, the pastor's wife's hair. Yes. Um, so he, and he's taking care of his, his mother and his father. Um, so he's doing well. And uh, I am so happy that he is 
uh, sort of emblematic of the film. You know, he is on our um, publicity for the film. That that scene uh, from the club is uh, what we use uh, to promote the film. Um, his is such a complicated journey. I, I think what we see in the film is that he believes uh, early on in life that he, um, he, well, first of all, he was raised in a religious uh, household where his mother uh, was an evangelist. And so he was taught that being gay was wrong. And, but he knew how he felt. He knew he was attracted to men. Um, so in his mind, uh, when he sees um, the Donahue episode, something clicks for him. It's like, oh, I, I'm, I'm trapped in, I'm a woman trapped in a male body. And so if, if being a male means I can't be a, attracted to men, that must mean I'm a woman. So I'll have to be a woman so that I, that will legitimize me being attracted to men. Um, so I, he felt he was trans. Um, but then he comes to a realization that um, he's not necessarily, he, he doesn't have to be trans in order to legitimately be attracted to men. But all of that is also wrapped up into uh, still a, a kind of religiosity that won't allow him to be sexually active with another man. Mm -hmm. um, so he's made a vow to be um, celibate. Um, but what I think we see in the, in the clip where I'm performing uh, chastity is that even though he has realized that he's not trans, he realized that chastity still is very much a part of who he is. And there's a kind of catharsis about that. Actually seeing chastity outside of him, like he is looking into that mirror, um, sort of breaks something open for him that I don't even know if he's ready to deal with to this day. Mm. But I do know in that moment, he recognizes that, no, I may not be trans, but chastity really is a part of who I am. Yeah. Uh, because one of the things that you don't see in the film is this moment where uh, he gets on stage mm. with the boa, with the earrings, and gives us a little bit of chastity, and then abruptly stops and says, uh, that's enough for now. Uh, a girl needs to get some coins if she's going to perform. <laughs> <laughs> Make that money. Let the money make you. I, I love it. That's 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 awesome. Yeah. 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 Thank. And I um and I um and the other the other gentleman who is still with us. No, that. So if you if briefly talk, and I want to also give working a couple of questions from our from our attendees. Um. So uh, tell us how how are how Sean, how's Freddie, how's Duncan, how are they doing? Did I, I make sure I got everybody right? Yeah. Sean, Freddie, Duncan, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, Sean is fabulous. Um, we uh, are in touch a lot as well. I've known Sean since he was 17 and being fast. Sneaking <laughs> 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 on to campus right. at UNC Chapel Hill when he handled business, sneaking on campus. Right. Um, and Sean, even though I don't perform him in the, in the play or in the film, played such a pivotal role in the making of the film because that's his home that we're... Uh, having dinner at or breaking mm -hmm. bread at the end of the film. Um, he also is responsible for helping me find a number of the men who are in Sweet Tea um, mm -hmm. to, to interview. Um, and uh, he's, you know, just fabulous. Mm -hmm. uh, Duncan, of course, um, is, has, it, that's my brother. That's my yeah. brister. Um, and yeah. uh, he's uh, come to Chicago and stayed with us a number of times. He and his husband. Uh, David have come, and uh, every time I go to Atlanta, we get together. He's really thriving. He is um, a universalist um, minister mm -hmm. uh, now and runs a church, and everybody loves him. I mean, how can you not? Um, and of course, yeah, as I said, Charles and I are, are still uh, in touch as well. Uh, and then Freddie, 
oh my God, if I um, had a dime for every shade, to every time uh, Freddie threw some shade, I would be rich. Oh my God. And it's so, he throws it so slyly too. And so subtle. You know? So just with the, and, with the, with the ponytail so, and all, right? <laughs> um, but Freddie and I actually traveled together to um, Mobile, Alabama in January. Uh, because the film was accepted into the uh, into a film festival down there, and so uh, Freddie and I represented the film, mm. and uh, the 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 festival was held at a casino down there. So Freddie had me out in the streets gambling, <laughs> <laughs> drinking. I said, I said, Freddie, I don't gamble. He said, Here's twenty dollars. If you win forty, give me forty. <laughs> <laughs> That's Freddie. That's Freddie. Yeah. I love it. That's awesome. Yes, I love it. And, you know, one of the things that I really hope to do when I uh, make some uh, greater coinage is to be able to afford one of his paintings because they're not cheap. Oh, right. Uh, I really would like to have one of those in my possession. Absolutely, thank you. And uh, and and again, I I tell as I mentioned in the beginning, but I'm going to keep saying, I I've had the pleasure of meeting all these folks, and they are just a delight. And uh, but I do want to. But speaking of film festivals, I do want to go into one of our, our, our attendee questions from our oh someone we know named Xavier. Uh, <laughs> Xavier Esters. Um, thanks for your question. It's a good. It's a great question. It's a segue from from what you were just talking about. Film is seeing great success at various film festivals. How has the pandemic impacted your plans? And does the virtual nature in which we're living made getting exposure easier or more difficult? And let's talk about the filmmakers as well. That might be a good moment to do this too. I want to Yeah, so um, it definitely has changed um, the nature of how the film is, is being um, screened because all the festivals that we've uh, gotten into, and one is going on as we speak in, in Austin, Texas, Texas, the All Genders, All Lifestyles, um, Independent Film Festival, which we did a Q&A for on yesterday. Um, they're all virtual. And some of the, some of the ones that are virtual are, um, you can you can see them if you buy a, a, a pass, you can see them from where you are, but some of them are specific to their region. So for instance, uh, the All Genders, All Lifestyles um, Festival in Austin, it's geo-protected, so you can only see it if you're in Texas. Uh, but we've screened in Mumbai, uh, India. We've screened in Utah. Uh, my little hometown of Hickory accepted. Uh, the Foot Candle Festival, which will take place in September, we'll be screening there. But all of it's been virtual. But we've been doing some um, Q&As uh, for the festivals. Um, John, Noor, and I uh, have been doing uh, Q&As and talkbacks. And that's been great because... One of the things that it had that has meant is that more people get uh, to see the film than would have if those festivals were been, had been uh, in person. But what it's meant for us is that we don't get to travel to some of the places because mm-hmm. it's not the same like being shoulder to shoulder in uh, a um, uh, in a, a screening room or in a um, a cinema a theater. Uh, watching it on the big screen. Uh, right. We just heard uh, that we got accepted into a film festival in Palm Springs, mm. and they, they're they going to be doing a um, uh, outdoor, what do you call it, the uh, drive-in. Drive-in. Mm-hmm. So that might be, you know, worth even uh, risking COVID to <laughs> get well, on the you know, and go see that the drive-in. You know, I must say, if you fly uh, uh, United or JetBlue, the only place experience I've had, they they have their shit together. So you know, I, I felt safe and comfortable. So it it might be worth. I don't I don't know about risking it all, but I guess I did. So you you can make it work. Uh, that's and uh, speaking. Let's stay on the film. Um, Dr. Keith R. Green has a question. Um, the film talks about how these these men have confronted the intersection of sexuality and religion, but not necessarily how they have reconciled it for themselves. Can you elaborate on this from their perspective as well as your own? Thank you, Keith, for that question. Yeah, I think that the, the, the person uh, of the men uh, who have done the most work around that is Duncan Teague, who is a minister. Um, and he, you know, is very clear about um, 
how his journey around religion um, has played out. And for a while, I think it's the, even in the film, um, uh, we practice, we do a, the Quaker thing of, of prayer where it's just silence. Um, because his partner, David, uh, is Quaker. Um, so Duncan has done a lot of work around that and arrived at a certain place. Um, Freddie, for all intents and purposes, is atheist. He's like, the only thing you can, uh, only thing I can find in a, in a church is a good man, maybe. <laughs> um, so... <You're> not wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, yeah. Um, so he's just... He's kind of like a disavow. Someone like Sean is still very much um, uh, religious, uh, or, or as you say, uh, practice Christianity, goes to church. His mm -hmm. faith is, is very much uh, a part of who he is. Um, the Heralds were not very religious at all. Um, uh, Charles, on the other hand, as you all witness, is... Um, still very religious and uh, kind of uh, in a, I would say still in a transitional space around reconciling uh, his uh, religion and, and his uh, sexuality. Um, for myself, I still very much identify as a Christian, uh, but I don't go to church. Um, I made a decision a very long time ago that I would not uh, uh, sort of go to a place where I had to anticipate the homophobic turn. Right. And so I know that there, there are um, progressive churches um, in Chicago. Um, but for me, uh, spirituality uh, doesn't necessarily have to take place in a building called a church. Uh, mm -hmm. I could have communion at my house all the time. I've had many a religious experience. Yeah. Hallelujah. At my home. <laughs> <laughs> As we all are right now. Right? Yeah, we yeah. all are right now. So you were ahead of the curve. That's you, you knew you saw this shit coming. <laughs> yes. No, thank you for that. Yeah. And, and and I will add to that. It's interesting to find it, I, I and I often have my back and forth struggles too, but it is one of those things that um as Duncan Teague said in the you have it in the play, you can't have church without us. But it is interesting that, you know, they want our time, our talent, our treasure, but they don't want our tea. So Somebody right. write that down. But uh, but it's it's the thing. That's 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 that and that's stuff. It's not going to struggle. So Keith, thank you for that question, my friend. Um, a question about the film as well. What was um one of the hardest scenes you had to cut out of the film, and why did you cut it? I imagine there was more than just one scene you had to cut, and it was a struggle. Tell us about that. Yeah, there. As I said before, there were eighty hours of footage. Uh, that we have so many things. Uh, I was just talking about this yesterday. Before and one of the Q&As. Um, we were able to, to film and um, while I was on the dance floor, uh, mm. uh, um, the uh, my the room and interviewing them, and it was really fascinating for me to hear, because I didn't know what they were saying to me until I saw the footage later on, uh, mm -hmm. what they were saying about me uh, and their, you know, sort of uh, remembering me from high school and growing up and so on and so forth. Um, and there was one, one of my friends, a particular white woman, um, who I was really, really close to, and she became emotional in the, um, um, in the interview because she was talking about how she used to give me a ride home from school oh. uh, because we were both in student council mm -hmm. and I would have her drop me off at this house that wasn't my house because I was too ashamed to let her know that I lived in the projects. Mm -hmm. And it was, I think at our 20th high school reunion, I shared with her that that's not where I live. And in this interview that's not in the film, she becomes emotional talking about how she was so ups upset that I felt that I, that I had to feel ashamed of where I lived, that it didn't matter. I could have lived, you know, under a rock. It didn't matter that she loved me. And that was like very emotional, whatever. but it got cut. It's on the cutting floor. Mm -hmm. um, and some, some other little scenes where we are just cutting up uh, 
especially Freddie. Oh my God. Freddie cut up so much during the mm-hmm. shooting. <laughs> uh, but we had to uh we had to cut some of those uh, some of those out. Um, oh, and there's also a cute moment in uh when uh Charles is doing his client's hair where he is cutting up. We had to chop that out because Ellen Champagne King is on the radio and we couldn't buy the rights because she's trying to charge too much. She was born to pay LaBelle. <laughs> oh my God. Ellen needed her coins too. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. There's a, there's a question that came from a, a, one of our guests that asked, um, well, the question, well, do, you, do you miss living in the South? And if so, in what way? Um, well, I don't even, I don't have to miss it anymore because I now have uh, a house in Asheville, North Carolina. It's right. just an hour away from where I grew up. Um, so before then, yes, I really did uh, miss living in the South. Um, not so much um, those uh, hateful Julys and August, which is just, you know, uh, Hebrew slave heat. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and the humidity, but I really, I miss you know, some of the food, and I should miss it because, you know, <clears throat> uh, I, I miss the the kind of, um, I don't know, everybody's family in the South. And, you know, a lot of people who, who haven't been to South to go for the first time, and everybody's talking to them, and the, you, know, you in the grocery store, and the clerk is, you know, striking up conversation. A lot of people think that, that that's fake, but it's no, it's genuine. Mm-hmm. And I miss that um, sometimes. Um, and just how easy it is. Nobody's in a rush. Uh, mm-hmm. You just kind of ease into everything. So uh, that it's my respite now from the city life and go down and sit on my front porch in my rocking chair, uh, drinking my tea. It may not be sweet, but it may have a little bourbon in it. I know that's right. <laughs> it gets the job done. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you to all of our audience for the audience questions. There may be a couple more too, but I want to get to a couple more before I have before we begin to wrap things up. Um, you all, many of the men in, your, in, the, in the film um, have experienced so much in their lives and have lived for decades and uh, been through a lot. Um, let's talk about the next generation of Southern Black gay men who are growing up down, down South now who have different experiences and different perspectives. Um, how do you think, do you believe, let me ask you, do you think the South has changed in some ways in the way it embraces uh, Southern black gay, black gay men. And how does this, how can this next generation be informed by the lessons that are talked about in, in, in Sweet Tea and making Sweet Tea? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, the, the young folks today are living their lives in a, in a way that's, that's full and present and uh, colorful. Um, not so, I think that the, the one distinction um, between, you know, the generation that are, that's featured in the film and, and this is, is that the younger they are more explicit about their sexuality. They're like, what, what, what you gonna say? Whereas, you know, someone like, you know, Duncan or Freddie, they never named it in the same way, even though they lived it. They embodied their their sexuality. They may not have um, named their sexuality the same way. Um, the other thing is, um, the young people today have really pushed. I think all of us to interrogate gender um, and its relationship to sexuality in terms of gender nonconformity, gender fluidity, um, transness, um, in some really uh, positive and progressive ways. Um, but I, I don't think uh, materially that too much has changed because people like um, Countess Vivian were trailblazing in the you know twenties and thirties. Uh, right. You know, Countess talks about uh, trans sex workers mm-hmm. uh, in you know these what he called the Crips <laughs> and he yeah. shot them in out. the red light district in New Orleans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, in New Orleans and and. So um, people were doing what they needed to do to survive and not just survive, to thrive, uh, even in that context. But we had different nomenclature. We had different ways of expressing it. Um, But I'm really excited about the ways in which some of the young folk, uh, and particularly in the South, are pushing uh, their parents um, 
their grandmamas mm -hmm. uh, in ways that, you know, you can have mm -hmm. a, a Black grandma in the South uh, refer to their child as queer and it'd be okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we, we keep evolving uh, yes. as humans, um, as a people, and it's all for the better. Thank you. And before I go to my last thing I need to do, because it is land illegal and this ain't free. No, it's, I want to give we give a moment because we must acknowledge that there is work that you've done work for, for our sisters as well. Um, you've collected stories of uh, queer black women in the South. So in case I was waiting for, I was waiting for S. Lee Edwards to chime in, what about the women? But so I will give you a moment, uh, Eve Patrick, if you don't mind, to tell us a little bit about your work um, for the sisters. Yeah, so that, that's funny that you uh, uh, said, what about the sisters? Because when I was performing Sweet Tea, inevitably someone would say, when are you going to do Pink Lemonade? <laughs> <laughs> which, which is, I did consider that, uh, the name, using that name, uh, actually. Uh, but so, um, because I kept hearing from the women about, uh, you know, when are you going to collect our stories? I finally, in 2012, did um, start uh, collecting the stories of Black Southern women who love women. Uh, what I didn't know at that time is that, that would end up being two books, not just one. Mm -hmm. uh, Black Queer Southern Women in Oral History, which is really the complement to Sweet Tea. You know, it's another tome, 600 pages. Uh, and those are, are, are kind of uh, longer excerpted um, stories from the oral histories. And then Honey Pot, which is creative nonfiction, much shorter. Uh, but I had a lot of fun uh, writing that one because it was my first um, venture into creative nonfiction. I created a, a, a trickster figure named Miss B who comes and kidnaps uh, this researcher uh, named Dr. EPJ um, mm. from his home uh, in Chicago and takes uh, him to her hive called Hyman. Ha uh -huh. so ha. You see what they did there, y'all? <laughs> uh, to uh, hear her sister's stories. And then along the way, uh, the two of them, you know, have this really uh, <laughs> combative relationship uh, where she has to get him together about his male privilege, uh, about his sexism, about his bouginess, and a whole bunch of things. Uh, but I think by the end of the book, um, you see uh, Miss B in a different light, and you see Dr. EPJ in a different light. And in, in between, you see uh, these beautiful stories by these women, beautiful and also heartbreaking stories by the women. So I'm so glad you did that. I know two of, a couple of my friends from high school are in that book too. So yes, I'm so Baton Rouge. Yes, yes, we got all kinds of Baton Rouge shit out. Y'all think Baton Rouge is a sleepy town, but no, we got a lot of shit happening in Baton Rouge. Uh, but you let's do. Take it. Yeah, we do. <laughs> in fact, there's a person in the uh, the play. DC is a DC. Yeah, I'm spilling that tea now for those who ever saw them. If you've seen the play, DC, who was at Southern University, that was someone I knew. So uh, God bless them. Uh, so. Patrick, thank you so much. And we want to do a little want to do a little housekeeping before we wrap it up. Uh, but everyone, uh, our attendees, we're so glad that you're with us. And as you know, creating a film like Making Sweet Tea required resources, lots of resources. So I want to, of course, acknowledge um, Steve, uh, Patrick's Sweet Tea, Stephen Lewis, he's, who's, who's been helping with the text today, too, for his work and all the creative team behind Making Sweet Tea. But similarly to the resources for Making Sweet Tea, going to court on behalf of LGBTQ people, requires resources too. And under the current administration in Washington, D.C., take a breath, I know, land illegal is in court a lot. Over the past three years, the bench has been stacked against us with Donald Trump appointing 200, 200 lifetime judges on the federal bench, a record for any first-time president. But even as the courts tilt to the right, land illegal is finding ways to win. Uh, as you all know, this summer, this past June, you may have heard of the vic tremendous victory hoping to stop workplace discrimination. Thanks to Land Illegal, we were able to convince six Supreme Court justices that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 protects gay and transgender employees from being fired because of who they are. This is an example of just how intertwined and interconnected the LGBTQ plus movement and the civil rights movement are. This victory would not have happened without our Black brothers and sisters and siblings paving the way some, uh, and sometimes giving their lives so we can have this moment that we have, oftentimes giving their lives, and many of them being unsung. So. It's important to keep uh, 
it's it's we also how important it is to be able to find a job to keep a job but how how difficult it is for black lgbtq plus people and it's fair to say that this decision was more impactful for more people uh in our community than the marriage decision was uh five years ago um we also won a great case just this past friday in florida um drew adams who's a trans boy in high school there was told he couldn't use the restroom at his own school we were there and the case was the first in the country to go to trial about a trans student's right to equal access to restrooms big news for students, not just in Florida, but around the country. But that work takes resources and support. And so we definitely need you. And we are so thankful that, as I mentioned before, last year we gathered together in community at E. Patrick and Stevens' home. And, uh, but today we're doing this online and virtually, but we're glad that you all are here. And so, and of course, making this happen and making this, making this movement continue going does require some support. And one of my beloved um, board members is online with us today too, uh, David De Figueredo. David and I joined the board at the same time in 2015. That's the right, David? I hope I did. Yeah, 2015. But David believes in the work that we're doing as well. And David is our white, I'm going to stop using ally. He's a white comrade. And as a white comrade, David is um, putting his money where his mouth is and supporting Black LGBTQ lives. So if you give today at this moment, and we're going to give you a moment to do that. If you give today, David is going to match every dollar that you give today. He's going to match a dollar for dollar. So if you give us 100 today, at the link that's going to be popping up in your chat box right now, Dave will double your donation to $200. If you give 250 David will make your donation to $500. So um, please consider that now. We would thank you, David. I know you, can't, you can see us, but you can hear us, hopefully. Th thank you, David, my friend, um, for your allyship, your comradeship, and for, and, and again, being a supporter of Black LGBTQ plus lives through your role as a member of the Land Legal Board of Directors and also as one of our vice presidents. So we're thankful for you for this and we hope that all of you who are here with us now will click the link below or if you're calling in, just uh, go to online to landallegal.org slash Sunday Tea and click the donate box there. And of course, you know, and once you give the donation, well, let us know in the chat box, that's fine. But again, it's, it's really what we really want to give you a moment to do. If you want to just chat and say, I gave, don't have to give you a mouth because as um, Tabitha Brown says, that's your business. But uh, we definitely encourage you to support and give. If you want to let us know that you've made a contribution in the chat box, let us know that too. So we'll pause for a moment and let you give you a chance to do that. In fact, while you're doing that, I do want to give, um, Patrick, there was one more question that I want to ask you. you at, we were, there was a question that came from an audience member about the current climate. Of course, I talked about that as far as land illegal. How do you, you talk about state-sponsored police violence in the film. You talk about how our lives have been under attack and threat for so many, since we've been here. How did you see, a question from the, an audience member, um, we didn't give their name, was how did you see this film as a tool to help empower folks um, as we look at the current state of affairs in the country? Well, you know, one of the things that not a lot of people talk about is the, the two of the founders of, Black Lives Matter identifies queer. And I think that piece often falls out of the, the, in the intersections of, of race and sexuality. And we have been on the forefront, queer folks have been on the forefront of many of the um, civil rights um, movements uh, for Black folk. Right. And so um, I want to see more of that. And I think the film in particular um, shines a spotlight on the fact of how integral we are. You know, people know about Byron Rustin, but people don't know about Duncan Teague mm. and the work that Duncan has done um, around um, AIDS and HIV uh, and how he's been on the front line. And they need to know about uh, the work that Sean Atkins has done in Atlanta around uh, access to uh, housing. Uh, for folk. Uh, they need to know the work that Freddie has done in donating some of his paintings to some of these uh, causes. Uh, the Heralds uh, gave their entire um, library to an HBCU uh, in um, Mississippi. So our lives are, are uh, intersectional. And I think the film uh, really uh, demonstrates how in this present moment that our queerness, uh, that our race, that our class, uh, that our ableism, uh, mm -hmm. all of that is a part uh, of the struggle. And so um, that's the way in which I hope that the film uh, plays a role in that. And I'll just one, I'll say one more thing about the, the film moving forward. So we're on the film festival circuit right now. 
uh, and will be through the fall. But we're now working with an agent to uh, try to get us a distribution uh, deal. All right. All, if we do, you know, and anybody out there uh, know somebody at Netflix or Hulu or one of those places, you know, let them know. Right. Um, but whatever proceeds we receive from a film deal and thereafter will go to a scholarship mm -hmm. uh, fund mm -hmm. for uh, an LGBTQ um, student at an HBCU. That's wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And Patrick, as you were doing the roll call of those stories need to be told, let's not, you forgot one important name. Dr. E. Patrick Johnson from Hickory, North Carolina. So Dr. Johnson, Dean Johnson, Dean Johnson, <laughs> thank you for, um, thank you for being you and bringing your authentic self to the table and to all the tables you travel to across the South, including my little table in Baton Rouge in 2005. <laughs> I appreciate you, we honor you. We thank you for this work. We thank, thank you to Stephen, all the director, all the folks who were involved with making this film that everybody had to a chance to enjoy, um, we can't we can't thank you enough. And it um, thank you for your contribution to the, to forwarding the movement. And again, thank you everyone for who joined us today. Thank you for making your contributions. Yes, thank you everyone. Thank you S. Lee and Brenda. Thank you Xavier. Thank you uh, Christina, Steve. I'm gonna miss somebody. So we gotta wrap it up. I'm sorry, I see a Dalton there. Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone. And again, the links are in the chat box. And please pick if you haven't picked up the book, Sweet Tea, the book itself. You can read my tea. Really, you can see it. If you and and definitely uh, get get Honey Pot. Get this book about Southern queer black women. Get those things and get these narratives and tell and read these stories, but also hopefully you will tell your own too. So again, any, any parting words you've got, Patrick? Uh, I think Patrick froze, uh-oh. I think he's, I think, uh, well, either way, we're good. Thank you all so much for joining Lambda Legal for this. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, IG, all those things we're on. We appreciate you and thank you for joining us for this wonderful conversation as we discuss making sweet tea with Dr. E. Patrick Johnson. You all take care.